Hey everyone, this is Ryan, and in this video we'll be talking about disease frequency. So in the last video we talked about the accuracy of screening and diagnosis methods, and how reliability and validity were the two main measurements that we used to calculate the accuracy. And it's just important to note that reliability and validity are measurements that are important for all studies. All good studies should report their reliability and validity of the methods that they use. So disease frequency has three major study methods associated with it. Uh, Cross-sectional surveys are concerned with prevalence of disease in the population. Prospective cohort studies are concerned with the incidence of disease in a population, and case studies are more concerned with the rare conditions in an individual. So cross-sectional surveys take a random sample from a sampling frame. And the sampling frame is just um, some source of demographic or population information that gives us information about the population that we're concerned about, that we want to find more information about. So cross-sectional surveys get their name from, be, from taking a cross-section in time, which just means a snapshot or looking at the present time and how much of a certain population has disease. So we can find this out through questionnaires or interviews and the target population refers to the whole population that we want to find more information about. Um, the target population could be say the entire uh, US population um, and it would be impossible to get everyone in the population to answer questionnaires or answer interviews so instead we take a sample from that target population so this would be the sample population which we can ask questionnaires to and hopefully this will be a good representation of the entire target population So the case definition just refers to um, some, some categorization of what the disease actually is and what it isn't. So the cases would be um, people who have disease and non-cases would be people who don't have disease. So prevalence is the frequency of disease for the population in the present. So again, that, that uh, sample population is going to provide a best estimate for the larger target population. And prevalence can be calculated by taking the amount of diseased um, people in that population and dividing by the total number of people in that population. Um, and this can be reported as a percentage or as a decimal, as in 10% of the study population has carries in the, in the present. And it's just important to know that the prevalence um, prevalence is something that refers to populations, whereas disease is something that refers to people or individuals. Now severity I just think of as an improved prevalence. Instead of just saying uh, yes or no, you have caries or you don't, you look at an average value of some diseased index, or some disease index, which could be a mean or a threshold, and one such index is the DMFT or decayed missing filled teeth index. And you can also use the uh, lowercase letters for primary teeth or the S means just refers to surfaces, any of the five surfaces of a tooth. Um, and, and these are all a little more clinically meaningful than just a simple yes or no, uh, do you have or do you not have caries answer. So the formula for calculating severity is very complicated. We don't need to know it. Um, what it can look like as a reported value is, say, 1.8 teeth with caries per child. Um, and we can extrapolate that out and say 18 affected teeth per 10 children or 180 affected teeth per 100 children, whatever is most meaningful um, as, a, as an outcome uh, that can be applied in the clinic. So anytime we take a random sample from the target population 
and make an estimate about that target population, we have sampling variability or sampling error. This is just the nature of taking estimates, and we'll see this for each of the studies. Because we can't ask the entire target population, we can only be, say, 95% confident of the answer that we got. So the 95% confidence interval is a likely range of the true or target population estimate. Um, so this is usually some sort of curve, and we have a, some mean value and then some standard deviations away from that mean value that give us that likely range. Now the brother or sister to 95% confidence intervals are the p, the p value, or the type 1 error. It's interesting to note that we usually use 95% for a confidence interval, and we usually use 0 0.05 as the threshold for p-value, and 0.95 uh, added to 0 0.05 is equal to 1. So they, they lead to the same conclusion. Um, in the case of p-value, you want a low value. If you're um, two, you have 0 0.02, then there's just a 2% probability that the difference in results, the statistical the t statistically significant difference um, is due to chance. So you want that number to be low because you want your results to be meaningful. You don't want them to just be because of chance that you got a, you got a cool result. You want, to be, um, you want that number to be low. If you increase the sample population, you're getting more of that target population, so likely you'll shrink the confidence interval, you'll shrink these standard deviations, and you'll get a smaller, more, um, a, a smaller curve, uh, a shrunken curve horizontally. So you'll be more confident that your, that the range of, of your estimate, um, is is smaller. So with cross-sectional surveys, you have convenient sampling, which is also referred to as consecutive patients which just refers to non-random sampling. Maybe you just talk to people that were easy to talk to, and this can result in obvious bias. Uh, incomplete data can also, um, can also occur, and this is from non-response or differing rates of response between relevant groups. So if you're taking the confidence interval from one study and then comparing that with the confidence interval from another study, say one was done for males and one was done for females, and um, there is a statistically significant result because these confidence intervals did not overlap, you'd want those, uh, the data from each group to be equal. You'd want to have similar, um, similar sizes for the sample population. So prospective cohort studies um, are a little bit better than the, um, the cross-sectional surveys we just talked about. And we'll also see prospective cohort studies in the next video on uh, etiology, where they're really useful. So prospective cohort studies take a random sample from a healthy, at-risk population. And this is slightly different from the cross-sectional surveys where we just asked a population. We didn't care if they were healthy or diseased. We wanted to actually find out about how many were diseased. So this time we just, we specifically ask people who we know are healthy and we know they're at risk or they're, they're not immune to getting, disease, to getting this disease. So we, we take one group, we don't separate uh, people, we just look at one random sample, and we take a baseline or initial assessment of these disease-free patients or their teeth, and then we wait some amount of time, and then we follow up with them, we take a second assessment to see if anyone got, um, got the disease, if there are any new events of disease. And this is known as incidence, the rate of developing new disease over time. So the incidence rate calculation is similar to prevalence, in that we sort of take the, disease, the number of diseased and divide that by the total, except this time we, we just um, are concerned with the new disease developed in a given time. How many of those people in the at-risk population got the disease? So this could be anywhere from 0 to 100%. 100% would mean everyone you asked got the disease, the disease, which would be really bad. And 
Um, this can also be reported as a decimal. And this is sort of um, talking about the risk or probability of the average person developing this disease. And again, when we're taking an estimate about the target population, we have sampling variability. So we'll see these two um, calculations. And then case studies, there, there's no statistical data here. Um, it's just uh, interesting findings, some rare or unknown case or condition, or something we don't know a whole lot about. A doctor comes across a cool case, decides to report a case study. All right, so uh, the next video will continue our discussion and talk about etiology as the third um, big thing that we're concerned with. So I hope this video is helpful, and I'll see you next time.